Uh, it's a sad day. I really enjoy the nervous system, but we have to move on. There's much more material to cover. So let's talk about the conductive segment. Remember, there's four functional segments to our neuron. The receptive segment, which is the cell body and the soma uh, and, and the dendrites. The initial segment, and that's where the axon hillock is. Then we have our conductive segment, which we're going to talk about today, the axon and the axolemma, lemma. And then we'll have the transmissive segment. So the conductive segment is like our wire that's going to conduct our signal from point A, the axon hillock, all the way down to point B, which is the transmissive segment. All right. So when we're talking about the axon, we're going to be talking about really what's going on at the plasma membrane of the axon, which is our axolemma. lemma. And so think of the conducted conductive segment as the area of the cell in which the action potentials are going to be traveling through. And so in case you're wondering what an action potential is, you've heard me say, oh, it's a nerve signal or a nerve impulse. But really, an action potential is when we depolarize the plasma membrane and then we repolarize it. And that's it. So during that process, we're going to flip that charge. Remember what I said? The outside of the cell is positive. The inside of the cell is negative. So when we are creating an action potential, we're going to flip that to look like this, to be positive on the inside and negative on the outside. Briefly, very quickly, very quickly, right? So if you recall, depolarization is when we make the inside of the cell more positive. How do we do that? The inside of the cell has to have a gain in positive charge. Well, sodium does that. Sodium enters into the cell from the outside through the voltage-gated sodium channels. So it makes the inside of the cell more positive. Repolarization is we're going to return our membrane potential back to the resting membrane potential value of negative 70. How do we do that? Okay, we have to make the inside of the cell more negative again following depolarization. So we're going to open up our voltage-gated potassium channels and we're going to let potassium leave the cell. It's going to take its positive charge with it and it's going to make the inside of the cell more negative. And so this is how we propagate the action potential all the way down the axon to the terminal end to the synaptic knobs. And then down there, okay, we're going to have a different series of events. So this basically, if you want to really kind of summarize what action potentials, what's happening is voltage-gated channels open up sequ sequentially all the way down the axial lemma, like dominoes falling down into one another. That's what happens here. And that's how we generate our nerve signal. So let's talk about how we generate our action potential. And so we're going to start off by talking about depolarization. Here's the first step. This should look familiar to you, okay? So let's just zoom in here. First of all, all right, what happens in the first step? Sodium enters from an adjacent region. So what does that mean? All right, sodium enters from an adjacent region. Remember we talked about those graded potentials before in the, in the receptive segment? And what would happen with the EPSPs, the excitatory postsynaptic potentials, they would open up, uh, what would happen is these neurotransmitters would open up the chemically gated channels and a cation would flow across those chemically gated channels. Well, sodium enters into the cell and so it starts to depolarize the plasma membrane. And as that happens, sodium will start to diffuse into the cell and it's gonna to diffuse towards the initial segment. So as it's trying to diffuse towards the initial segment, it's going to try to depolarize the cell enough to where we reach our threshold value. If you remember what that was, that was negative 55 millivolts. And so that's what happens here. Sodium is gonna enter, all right, from an adjacent region. That's going to be the axon hillock. That's going to trigger all right, the voltage-gated uh, sodium channels to open. So this is what we're looking at. So here's our axon hillock. All right, so sodium comes in. It starts to trigger the first, very first voltage-gated sodium channel opens up. So this is where we we'll see. And when that voltage-gated channel opens up, because the activation gate swings open, what does sodium want to do? it wants to go down its concentration gradient. So as sodium starts to enter into the cell, we start to see the cell depolarize. Once we get to negative 55 millivolts, that's our threshold value, then it's gonna take off like a bat out of you know where, okay? 
So the second step here is that the sodium enters the cell, right? And it causes the cell now to have a positive membrane potential on the inside. You can see how we flipped it. Here's its positive outside, negative inside. Now, as that sodium has been rushing in, it makes the inside of the cell positive. And so our value now shoots up, our membrane potential shoots up to positive 30. And that's because the channel is open. And so sodium just floods in. It comes in really quickly because it's one, diffusing down its concentration gradient, and two, it is getting pulled in initially by the negative charge on the inside of the cell because we have those negatively charged proteins and those negatively charged phosphate molecules that pull the sodium in. Opposites attract. Okay. <clears throat> so now, okay, in this step here, you can see we have reached that positive 30 value. And that's the stimuli that we needed to close the inactivation gates of our voltage-gated sodium channel. So remember, our voltage-gated sodium channels have three states, the resting state, the activation state, and the inactivation state. So the inactivation state follows the active state, which we just saw here. This is the active state. The active state is when both gates are open and sodium is flowing across. The inactivation state happens when the inactivation gate closes. Bam, shuts it down. No more movement of sodium. No more movement. Now, meanwhile, as this is happening, you can see that steps one and two are going to repeat in the adjacent areas, all right, near the next gate. So all this sodium has flooded into the cell here. And all this sodium is going to eventually then trigger this gate to open up. And that's what happens. So this gate will open up. It'll go, it goes from the resting state to the activation state. And then meanwhile, this gate, we're going to see on the next page, goes into the inactivation state. So while this is going on, we're going to start to see, it's like those dominoes falling, boom, 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 boom. They're going to move and bump into the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And this is going to go from, all right, the axon hillock all the way down to the synaptic knobs, the transmissive segment. All right. So following depolarization comes repolarization. Right? I joke around and I say, you know, what goes up must come down. That's what this is right here. Okay, our diagram is going up and then it's gonna go back down here. The charge is gonna drop back down. That looks messy, let me get rid of that. So what we're gonna see now with repolarization is we're going to make the inside of this, we're gonna to try to return our membrane potential back to the resting membrane potential value of negative 70. So once we reach that positive 30, we just talked about what happens to the voltage-gated sodium channels. The inactivation gates slam shut, no more sodium moves across. So we're not gonna get any more positive. So that triggers then the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channel. And so the potassium will leave the cell and it's gonna take its positive charge with it. And as it does that, it is going to cause now the membrane potential to become negative once again. We've returned back to normal. See, we're negative on the inside now. And so that's happening as potassium leaves the cell. And when we flip the polarity back to how it was when we first started, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. So what will happen is, unfortunately, we'll, as we get close to that negative 70, the, potass the voltage-gated potassium channels will start to shut and close. Not all of them close right away, that's okay. So we overshoot our mark and you can see we've overshot our mark here and we dip down to about negative 80 millivolts. So we now have hyperpolarized our cell. We've made the inside of the cell, all right, more negative than the resting membrane potential. That's the definition of hyperpolarization. When that happens, right, then our voltage gated potassium channel will close. 
right, like that. And our voltage gated sodium channel is also closed. So we're not gonna see a movement of the, um, uh, of the ions of anything crossing the plasma membrane. So how do we get back to that resting membrane potential of negative 70? The sodium potassium ion pumps. They'll return us back because they'll pump sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. And so that's how we reestablish our resting membrane potential. And this same process happens all the way down to the synaptic knobs, okay? So depolarization, followed by repolarization, then you'll have hyperpolarization. And so that will occur at each of those gates all the way down. So this is that graph I was telling you about. Learn this and you'll be fine, okay? How we get an action potential. We have a resting membrane potential of negative 70, right? In the receptive segment, we are trying to generate those uh, graded potentials. And as those graded potentials right, approach the axon hillock, we will have summation there. We're gonna add up everything and see if we've created enough change in the membrane potential to trigger all right, the opening of our voltage gated sodium channels. What triggers that? The threshold value. If we reach this value of negative 55 millivolts in the initial segment, the axon hillock, that will trigger the opening of our voltage gated sodium channels. And we'll begin depolarization in which we make the inside of the cell more positive. And so once depolarization occurs, you can see it just shoot right up to that positive 30 value. We hit that positive 30 value that triggers the closing of the inactivation gate of our sodium, our voltage gated sodium channels. So no more sodium is gonna be passing through. But then that also will trigger the opening of our voltage gated potassium channels. And so that moves us into repolarization because now potassium will start to leave the cell. And so we make the inside of the cell much more negative, okay? And so we're shooting to get back down to that negative 70. But unfortunately, we dip below that because, all right, we've let too much sodium out of the cell. Or excuse me, too much potassium out of the cell. And so now we've briefly hyperpolarized the cell, but no problem because then our voltage-gated potassium channels have closed. Our voltage-gated sodium channels are also closed. So then our um, sodium potassium ion pumps will take care of the rest. They'll reestablish that resting membrane potential of negative 70. So memorize this figure, 1222, that will help you. So let's talk about how depolarization and its propagation affects us in the real world. For example, local anesthetics, lidocaine's perfect example, Novocaine, okay? What they do is that they're going to block the nerve signal by inhibiting the voltage-gated sodium channels. So if it blocks the action of the voltage-gated sodium channels, we can't create a nerve signal. And if we can't create a nerve signal, we can't generate that pain signal that is coming to our control center or the central nervous system. You don't even realize it. So those, that's why those drugs are nice. ICE does something similar, okay? It won't block the nerve signal, but it slows the transmission down, okay? One of the ways, all right, I don't know if you remember this from chapter four, we talked about what can affect the rate of diffusion, how quickly those molecules can move in and out of, of areas, all right, when we're talking about diffusing down your concentration gradient. Well, one is how steep the concentration gradient is. Also, temperature is another one. The warmer the environment, the, the, the more movement you'll get from the molecules. Well, of course, if you um, put ice on it, you'll slow things down. The molecules will move slower. That will slow down the transmission, All right? So that helps, again, to reduce pain. I tell people to put ice on things all the time. When I lived up in New York, I would tell my patients to go sit out in a snowbank. They didn't appreciate it, but a part of me was serious. 
How does a graded potential differ from an action potential in terms of the types of channels involved and where it occurs? Now, I've got a slide later on in this show, all right, that will go into some detail about this, but I love this question. This is a wonderful question, okay? So our graded potentials are gonna be chemically gated channels. And that's gonna be in the receptive segment, which involves the dendrites and the cell body. Action potentials are only gonna be found in the axon and they involve voltage gated channels. Definitely know that. We'll move on to some of the differences here later on. Okay, so after we've created an action potential, right? Our action potential was our party. We had this big party, yay, everybody come, party, party, party. All right, now the party's over, everyone goes home. All right, we got to clean stuff up now, okay? Some stuff's going to happen, and that's called the refractory period. All right, so actually, the definition for a refractory period is going to be an actual period of time after we began or started the action potential, okay, to when it's impossible or difficult to fire another action potential. If it's impossible, we refer to that as the absolute refractory period. If it's difficult to fire another action potential, that's the relative refractory period. So let's talk about both, okay? Absolute is going to be when we have no, it doesn't matter how much stimulus that you are throwing at this neuron, it will not initiate another action potential. It doesn't matter. Nothing can happen, okay? So this is because of that unique uh, uh, um, function that our sodium, our voltage-gated sodium channels have. Remember, they have those three states. This comes from the inactivated state. Remember the inactivated gate slams closed, okay? And it's going to stay closed for one millisecond and it won't open, okay? This is cool because it stays closed. This makes sure that one, we don't get another action potential but also that the action potential only moves in one direction. And that's towards the synaptic knob. It cannot go upstream. It cannot go back towards the receptive segment. So it's because of this physiological fact, this inactivated state, that inactivated gate being closed, all right, that prevents all right, that um, action potential from going upstream, it only goes downstream. It only goes towards the synaptic knobs. All right, that's the absolute refractory period. So the re re absolute refractory period is then followed by the relative refractory period. Now this is when we can get another action potential to occur, All right? Because by now, the, sodium, the voltage gated sodium channels have now gone from the inactivated state back to the resting state. Right, but what, but, 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 we need a little bit extra stimulus here. A little bit extra, okay? Because our cell is now hyperpolarized. So we're no longer dealing with, we're no longer dealing with the resting membrane potential value of negative 70. Now it's like negative 80, negative 75. Uh, I'm trying to read that. Doesn't it get shot out of the synapse when it has enough charges? Uh, Rachel, I'm not quite sure what you mean by it's. What it is, are you talking about the action potential being shot out of the synapses when it gets enough charges? Or are you talking about um, sodium, potassium? I'm a little bit com confused by that. If you want to just let me know. Okay, let's see what you have to say. Okay, think on it. Let me know for sure. I might answer your question though here in a moment, okay? So the relative refractory period, we just need a greater stimulus now, okay? Because unfortunately, some of those potassium channels are still open. And so they're still leaking their positive charge out of the cell. And so the cell is dropping down to become even more negatively charged than the resting membrane potential. So here's a great, um, picture here to kind of explain that as to what's going on. All right, so again, we have our threshold, our resting membrane, then we have our graded potentials, then we have our depolarization, and then we have our, our repolarization. So as we get here, all right, into our repolarization, 
you're going to see now our absolute refractory period is going to occur as soon as the cell depolarized. The clock is ticking. Okay, as it's going through, all right, the depolarization process and the repolarization process, we cannot have another action potential. But you'll notice here when our cell is hyperpolarized, we can have another action potential because by the time we get here during the hyperpolarization period, our voltage gated sodium channels have reset themselves back to that resting state. But we now, our membrane potential is down here at around negative 80. So instead of that minimum value of positive 15 millivolts to get to our threshold value, now we just need a positive 25 millivolt uh, difference to get to that threshold value. So it just takes a little bit longer, or I shouldn't say longer, a little bit more. So what type of channels are sequentially open in the propagation of, of an action potential depolarization? Voltage gated sodium channels. By now you should know this, right? In the propagation of repolarization, voltage gated potassium channels. You should know this, commit that to memory. Please, please, please do that for me. All right, so we talked about how an action potential is generated. We've talked about how an action potential propagates down the axial lemma. Now we're going to talk about the two methods to which it gets conducted down the axial lemma. I think I was talking about the synaptic vesicles go through the roots. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Hold that thought. And I say that only because we're going to talk about what happens down there at the synaptic vesicles. Okay. That's, we still have to cover that. And so I might answer that question. Okay, so just hold that thought for me. Because we're going to, I love talking about the, uh, the transmissive segment where the synaptic valves are. All right, well, let's talk about the two different types of conduction that can occur down our axon. Now, this whole time, I've pretty much been telling you and describing to you continuous conduction. All right, continuous conduction does not involve that myelin sheath that I was discussing. So when we talk about continuous conduction, that occurs in unmyelinated axons. So one voltage gated channel opens up, that will trigger the next one to open up, which will trigger the next one, which will trigger the next one. And so it has to do with how this occurs, all right, how this process spreads from one region to an adjacent region. So it's a sequential process. And this is going to occur down the entire length of the axon. That's a guaranteed thing. Oh, okay. I don't know who Mr. Vargo is. Should I know Mr. Vargo? I like that name though. All right. So the other type of conduction, and this is the one that's gonna be kind of new. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha is the saltatory conduction. Now, saltatory conduction, all right, this occurs in myelinated axons. We talked about myelinated axons. Those are gonna be the, the axons that are covered, all right, with that myelin sheath that was generated by the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system or the neurolemocytes in the peripheral nervous system. So they create these fatty coatings around the cell. And believe it or not, myelinated axons will conduct an action potential faster. And we're going to discuss that. So what will happen is these action potentials will only occur at the neurofibril nodes. Now, if you remember what those are, I'll show you a picture here. These are the neurofibril nodes, the spaces in between. Now, this is showing you a picture of uh, axon in the peripheral nervous system because these are the neural lemocytes, the Schwann cells. You can see the nucleus there. So our action potential is only going to occur in these gaps here, in the neurofibril nodes, all right? So I'm gonna to describe to you what happens. All right, at the neurofibril nodes, we're gonna have the same players involved, our voltage gated channels, okay? But we're gonna have a huge amount of those channels in that area there. So we have to concentrate them. 
in there. We'll, we won't see any myelin there. So the same sort of scenario occurs, right? The voltage gated sodium channels will open up and sodium will pour rapidly into the inside of our myelinated axon. Now, here's what happens. Similar to what we saw with the graded potentials. Remember how the graded potentials occurred? The, the ions would diffuse into the cell and those, and those uh, ions would diffuse in the direction towards the uh, axon hillock to the initial segment. This same scenario happens here. The sodium ions will diffuse into the cell and they're going to move on the inside of the cell down towards the synaptic knobs. They're going to move downstream. Now, just like a graded potential though, okay, remember how I said the graded potential becomes weaker and weaker and weaker with the distance that it travels, all right, because it starts to encounter resistance from the cytosol, same thing here, okay? So these sodium ions enter in, they start to move in the direction downstream towards the synaptic knobs there, but as they travel further and further and further, they become weaker and weaker and weaker. But here's the thing, they make it to the next node. That's what we're seeing in this picture here. Okay, so the sodium enters in, it starts to diffuse down and it's getting weak and weak and weak, no problem. It made it to this node here, then it triggers another action potential. It's like a turbocharger. You ever played uh, Mario Kart and you're driving your little cart there and you, I don't remember one of the things that you hit, but it gives you like a, a speed boost. That's what happens here, okay? So we get to our next neurofibril node and we get a refresh of more sodium. So it triggers the opening of the voltage gated sodium channels, all right? And then eventually the, it'll trigger the opening of the potassium, the voltage gated potassium channels potassium leaves, sodium enters in, and it gets a boost, and it shoots down again. And then it starts to get weak and tired again. No problem. We made it to the next node, bam, and it shoots down. And this continues the whole way. See, the nice thing is this myelin sheath creates an insulation around the axon. And so that, that forces the sodium Okay, to stay in the axon, and it can only go in one direction. It cannot diffuse outside the axon, which then allows it then to get recharged. So it used to be believed that this, the, the signal would uh, hopscotch. It would jump from node to node to node. But actually, it's just, I mean, it's kind of doing that, but it's due to the diffusion of the ions right through the axon there. Whoops. Okay, so when we see this, all right, we're just going to repeat this from node to node to node. And what will happen is this type of conduction is way faster than continuous conduction. And it uses less ATP because, all right, we're insulating the uh, axon. Things aren't leaking out. Remember those leak channels? Well, guess what? These neurofibril nodes, okay, are making it easy for those pumps to maintain the resting membrane potential. Because now we don't have to worry about sodium and potassium leaking out. So those pumps just keep pumping out the sodium, keeps pumping in the potassium. And then when those voltage gated channels open up, bang, everything just explodes in a good way. Okay. So keep in mind the myelinated areas here are insulated and so they'll prevent ions from moving across the axial lemma. And so if they're not moving across the axial lemma, they're gonna move, all right, downstream when an actual potential is generated. And that's what you see here. How does conduction of an actual potential in an unmyelinated axon and a myelinated axon um, differ, okay? A myelinated axon is going to utilize continuous conduction. And so the action potential is going to go down the entire length. In myelinated axon, it's only, the action potentials only occur at the neural fibril nodes. All right, so it almost like jumps from node to node to node. Okay? But in reality, it's because we're seeing the diffusion of the sodium moving quickly through the axoplasm. It pushes it through there until the next node where it gets a recharge. And then it gets pushed quickly down again until it makes it to the next node and gets another recharge. All right, now we're down 
to the last segment of our neuron. This is the transmissive segment. The transmissive segment is the synaptic knob. Now, you probably know what I'm going to be talking about because I've talked about bits and pieces of what occurs at the synaptic knob. But in case you don't, no problem. We're going to now piece everything together and it's all going to make sense to you. And you're going to be so appreciative as you're laying in bed tonight, recalling the events of the day. So our action potential is traveling down the conductive segment, which is the axon. And it comes all the way down to the axon terminals, the teledendra. At the end of those axon terminals are the synaptic knobs. Those are those swellings. So on the synaptic knob, we have, all right, special, I shouldn't say special, but we have these transport proteins that we really haven't talked about too much. All right, we have our calcium ion pumps and our voltage-gated calcium channels. So the calcium ion pumps, they did the same thing, all right? They, well, they do the same thing that the sodium potassium ion pumps do in the other parts of the cell, all right? It's going to create a concentration gradient. And so it does so. It pumps calcium out of the cell. So it makes sure that there's more calcium out of the cell than inside the cell. So our action potential travels down and it reaches our very first voltage-gated calcium channel and it triggers the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channel. So once that channel opens up, we all know where calcium wants to go. It wants to diffuse from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. It wants to move into the cell, and that's what happens. Calcium diffuses into the synaptic knob because there's more calcium outside. And when it moves into the knob, it is going to bind to the synaptic vesicles. Well, what the heck are the synaptic vesicles? Those are those little membrane sacs. I like to call them little bubbles, okay? And these are these membrane sacs that contain our neurotransmitter, our chemical messenger. So these calcium ions just cover these synaptic vesicles. And if you notice, calcium has a two plus. It's a cation, it's positively charged. So now these synaptic vesicles just get littered with this positive charge. And so we've polarized these synaptic vesicles. We'll check it out here on my drawing. Look at our cells. What do we notice about the cells? There's a positive charge on the outside of the cell. There's a negative charge on the inside of the cell. Well, that applies to the synaptic knob. Same thing. The inside of the synaptic knob's plasma membrane is going to be negatively charged and the outside is going to be positively charged. So if we coat these synaptic vesicles with these positively charged calcium ions, they're going to be attracted to the negative charge on the inside of the plasma membrane. So you know the saying, opposites attract. So guess what? The synaptic vesicles will now fuse with the plasma membrane through exocytosis it releases that neurotransmitter into the cleft. And that neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft. And it's gonna bind onto our postsynaptic receptors. Okay, these are called ligands. Okay, the postsynaptic receptors can be on another neuron or they could be on an effector. And so what will happen is, and we'll talk about this more so in chapter 10 when we're talking about muscles, right? Then that will trigger, all right, if those receptors are attached to a channel, that will trigger a channel to open up. And then what will happen will happen. We saw how that was able to generate graded potentials in the postsynaptic neuron. So the nice thing about these neurons is we can make more than one type of neurotransmitter, but, but only one type is released at a time. We talked about this before when we were talking about the graded potentials. And so the type that is going to be released is dependent on the frequency of the action potentials that come down to the synaptic knob. So say we get like one or two action potentials 
per second, we're going to release neurotransmitter A. But if we get like 50 or 100 action potentials, all right, per second that come to the synaptic knob, then we'll release neurotransmitter B. Okay, so the frequency of the action potentials is going to determine what type of neurotransmitter that we're going to release. Cool, huh? So here's what happens. I'll zoom in at our synaptic knob. Okay, so this is showing you what happens at what we call the neuromuscular junction when a motor neuron synapses onto our skeletal muscle cell. I just got done teaching this about two hours ago. All right, we're going to talk about this next week. Okay, so how? All right, this motor neuron is going to release its neurotransmitter onto this effector. So here's a picture for you. All right, so here comes our action potential, travels down, okay, bringing its electrical signal with it, and it reaches its very first voltage gated calcium channel. It triggers the opening of that channel, and calcium will start to enter into the cell, and that will trigger the opening of other channels. And so calcium diffuses into the cell, right? The calcium ions glom onto or bind onto the uh, synaptic vesicles. And then that then, um, I should say stimulates, but giving it a positive charge, it then causes that synaptic vesicle to move towards, all right, the plasma membrane here. It fuses with the plasma membrane and releases the neurotransmitter through the process of exocytosis. The neurotransmitter then is released into the synaptic cleft. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft and it binds on to the receptors here on our postsynaptic tissue or organ. In this case, it's skeletal muscle. And it'll trigger the opening of some channels here. And then we'll see the diffusion of um, ions across the plasma membrane. But that's for chapter 10. We'll talk about that another time. All right, so what is the sequence of events from the arrival of an active potential at the synaptic knob until the release of neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft? There you go. Okay, there you go. The last three slides that I was talking about, that's it in a nutshell. Voltage-gated calcium ion channels open due to the action potential. Calcium diffuses into the synaptic knob, okay, binds to the synaptic vesicles, causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane and release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft via exocytosis. Booyah. Not too bad, right? Okay. Here is that slide that I promised you earlier on. What's the difference between a graded potential and an action potential? So you should really, really make sure that you know everything on here right, to understand the real true differences, okay? So one is location. Where does an action, or excuse me, where does a graded potential occur in the receptive segment? Which is going to be the soma, the cell body, and the dendrites. And when this occurs in the receptive segment, what does it trigger the opening of? Chemically gated channels. And with action potentials, this occurs in the conductive segment, the axon or, or axolemma, and it is going to trigger the opening of voltage gated channels. And so when these gated channels open up, that will allow the diffusion of the ions across the plasma membrane. So when we talk about graded potentials, okay, we'll have a positive or negative change in the charge of the membrane potential. Remember our IPSPs and our EPSPs? EPSPs are going to depolarize and make the charge um, more positive, whereas IPSPs are going to hyperpolarize the membrane and make it more negative. Whereas with action potentials, we're always going to start off with depolarization as sodium rushes in, and then followed by repolarization as potassium leaves. All right, graded potentials, funny, they're, they're graded. What do you mean? A, B, C, D? No. What I mean is we'll have a larger potential change, all right? We'll have a greater change in the membrane potential if we can generate a stronger stimulus. How do we generate a stronger stimulus? We release more neurotransmitter. And what does that do? That will open up 
more gates, more chemically gated channels will open up with more neurotransmitter. Cool, All right? And the action potential, remember this guy, all or none, okay? We, meet, we reach threshold, all right? It's on, baby, and you can't stop it. If you go sub-threshold, nothing's going to happen. Greater potential is local, okay? They travel a short distance. Why? Because they encounter resistance and eventually will fade out. But with action potentials, again, they will propagate down the entire length of the axon all the way to the synaptic knob. Once we start an action potential, you can't stop it. You should know that. All right. So speed is always of the essence. Speed is great, especially when, and I'm not talking about the drug speed. I am talking about, all right, speed in an action potential because it can be life-saving, especially when we're talking about reflexes. So when we talk about conduction speed, there's two things that are going to influence the speed at which an action potential travels down the axon. One is if it's myelinated or not. We just talked about that. The other is diameter, all right? Bigger, thicker neurons, all right, or fibers are going to account for less resistance. And so if there's less resistance, remember Ohm's law, if we decrease resistance, we'll increase, all right, current. And so the less resistance we have, all right, the quicker our current can move down the axon. Okay, so diameter, bigger, thicker nerves are going to conduct uh, uh, the action potentials faster. Myelinated will conduct uh, um, action potentials faster than unmyelinated. So here you can see the different fiber groups. Right, and when we talk about what a nerve fiber is, that includes the axon and its myelin sheet. So the fastest one are the group A. Now, this is fast, folks. Right, has a conduction velocity 150, that's meters, by the way, 150 meters, 3.3 feet equals one meter. So go ahead and do the math on that. All right, it's fast. So these type of nerve fibers are going to have large diameters and they're going to be myelinated. So this is going to include all, I shouldn't say all, um, but most of our somatic sensory neurons, but all of our somatic motor neurons. Okay, that's quite a big uh, group there. Now, group B is slightly smaller, right? It's 10 times slower, 15 meters per second. Okay, so these would be smaller in diameter and some can be myelinated or unmyelinated. The smallest one are group C, one meter per second. And group C are usually pain receptors, okay? Not that the pain's not important, all right? But this brings up what's called the gate theory. And the gate theory, and I'm not gonna bore you with this, but quickly, uh, the gate theory is like you're taking a hammer and you're hammering in a nail and you accidentally hit your thumb, okay? When you're hammering and you start to shake your thumb back and forth. And as you're shaking it, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt as much because as you're shaking it, all right, you're creating that, movement and all those receptors in that area are sending sensory information up to your brain. And that sensory information is bombarding your brain and the pain signals um, can't get to the brain because they travel on smaller and slower fibers, group C, whereas when you're shaking your finger around, right, that those signals are going to travel on the group A. And so they kind of block out the group C, the pain. Not completely, because you still will feel some pain. <clears throat> okay, so this brings me to that impulse frequency that I was telling you about. Remember, we were discussing how action potentials, all right, depending on their frequency of their arrival at the synaptic knob, will determine what type of neurotransmitter is being released, okay? So we now know that action potentials, all right, can travel down the axon at different frequencies. It could be high frequency or low frequency. And basically what the frequency is, action potentials per second, okay? So when we talk about this, all right, we're going to see, all right, that 
frequency does play a role, especially, and I've already talked about it when we're talking about the neurotransmitters down here. All right, but if you know anything about wave uh, 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 physics, okay, you have a frequency, that's how many like waves are traveling. And then we also have the amplitude is how tall the waves are, okay? And that's represented as a change in the voltage there. So what we'll see is here, if we are, are going to, um, uh, how do I wanna say this? Not regulate the frequency, but influence the frequency, right? We'll see that depending, um, we'll see some influence from the strength of the stimulus in regards to the amplitude here. All right, so what we'll see, is we'll talk about this in chapter 16, when we're talking about bright lights, okay? When certain stimuli are going to generate faster or more frequent frequency of firing of action potentials. And so that will um, give us one type of, of effect. Whereas when we slow down the frequency, okay, then that will give us a different effect. Meaning, okay, let's use the example bright lights. Bright lights are going to stimulate the photoreceptors in your eye to generate and fire action potentials at a higher frequency. Whereas when you're in dimly lit rooms, all right, those, photo, those same photoreceptors will not be stimulated as much. So they'll have a slower firing rate for, of frequency of action potentials. And depending again on what, how, how much, what the frequency is will determine how your brain interprets that information. All right, if we get a high, firing frequency rate, um, and it's because you're outside in the sun, okay, your brain will interpret that, all right, as the bright lights, okay, when you're in a dimly lit room, okay, your brain will have slower firing frequency rates coming, and that will interpret it as a dim light, okay. Motor nerves are going to fire faster, okay, and as that occurs, we can generate more muscle tension with that. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we get into chapter 10. All right, so let's finish up here and discuss neurotransmitters, okay? We know that neurotransmitters are those chemical messengers that get released at the synaptic knobs into the synaptic cleft. The neurons will make their neurotransmitter, they'll store the neurotransmitter in the synaptic knobs. Once that action potential comes down, it will trigger the release of that neurotransmitter from the synaptic knob. It'll cross the cleft and it will bind to the receptor on the target cell. So there's hundreds of different types. And again, depending on what type of neurotransmitter will determine all right, what type of effect occurs. So we have four classes for our neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine, biogenic amines, amino acids, and neuropeptides. Now acetylcholine, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that in chapter 10, okay, that's with the muscles. But you wanna know, all right, what effect neurotransmitters will have. Well, acetylcholine can be either excitatory or inhibitory. When we're dealing with muscles, it's always excitatory. Always excitatory. Our next class of neurotransmitters are the biogenic amines or the monoamines. They're sometimes referred to as MAOSs. So what we'll see here, we're going to see the use of, all right, certain amino acids. And you've heard of some of these like catecholamines, like dopamine, all right, indolamines, which is our serotonin, right, these different types. And, it, and what will happen is we'll take an amino acid, we'll make some modifications to it, and then we'll wind up with one of our biogenic amines. So when we're making uh, things, dopamine is a derivative from tyrosine one of our 20 amino acids, right? And then serotonin comes from, all right, histidine. Now, you folks should know this one right here. You're gonna be very familiar with that at the end of November, all right, tryptophan. That's the one that everyone says, oh, if you eat turkey, right? Because turkey is high in, in, in this um, uh, amino acid, uh, tryptophan will cause uh, sedentary, um, sedationary type of effects. You'll feel tired. 
okay? And so that's one of the effects that that amino acid has on you. All right, what's an amino acid? It's a building block for protein. We talked about that back in chapter two. And so some of these amino acids will play a role as a neurotransmitter, glutamate, glycine, and GABA. And then finally, we've got our neuropeptides. And peptides is when we start stringing along, all right, amino acids, all right, into, and making a chain anywhere between 20 to 40 amino acids long. And some of the neuropeptides that are pretty popular, endorphins, all right, we've heard of endorphins, especially when you have like an adrenaline rush. All right, substance P is, is a neuropeptide that's released when you're in pain. And kephalons is another feel good. All right, endorphins and enkephalons are that feel good uh, neuropeptide when you're feeling pretty good. Uh, and then somatostatin right, is another type of neuropeptide neurotransmitter that we're going to utilize. All right, so when we're talking about our neurotransmitters, when we're discussing the physiology or the function, all right, we're going to classify them on what they do to the membrane potential. How do they affect the membrane potential? Do they make it more negative? Do they make it more positive? Okay, if they make it more positive, then they're going to be excitatory. Okay, so these type of neurotransmitters we discussed before are going to be are going to help generate our EPSPs. If they make the membrane potential more negative, past the resting membrane potential, right, of that negative 70 value, then they're going to hyperpolarize. So those are going to be inhibitory. And so those are going to create the generation of the IPSPs. All right, so that's one way that we classify them. Another way is by their action. So we have two types, direct and indirect. Now, a lot of this we've been talking about has been direct, in which the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor and it causes the opening of the chemically gated channels. And this is what happens right, on the postsynaptic um, cell. Indirect, a little bit of a different story. Now, these neurotransmitters are going to bind to the receptor, but here, that receptor now on the inside of the cell has what's called a G protein. And these G proteins are going to then activate what we call secondary messengers. Now, the nice thing about it is the effects all right, are going to be more diverse, but all right, this uh, pathway is a little bit more complicated for us to understand. So I liken it to this. You'll get into more detail about indirect um, when you get into uh, uh, 211. But think of it like this. You've got a butler at your house. Okay, You're upstairs. I don't know. You're in the shower. Someone comes to the door and they have a message for you. So they knock on the door. The butler doesn't open the door, but comes up to the door and says, who is it? What do you want? That person says, I have a message for so-and-so, all right? Um, and the butler says, give me the message. I will tell so-and-so. So that's what happens. So the neurotransmitter outside the door gives the message to the butler, which is our secondary messenger. And, it, and the butler brings that information to you, okay? So that's basically how indirect transmitters work. All right, so here you can see all right, the four different classes. You should know those. And then when we're talking about how we classify a neurotransmitter, all right, the two ways that we do it, do the effects, is it excitatory or inhibitory? And then also the actions. Is it direct? Right? Does it directly open up channels or is it indirect? Does it utilize the activation of G proteins and secondary messengers? All right? Does it use the butler? What are the four primary classes of neurotransmitters? There you go, acetylcholine, amino acids, monoamines, and neuropeptides. Those are going to be your four primary classes. So I wanna talk about um, acetylcholine here because it's a very popular one. We're gonna be talking about it a lot. And plus, if I talk about it here, it'll help you um, when we get into chapter 10. All right, so, Acetylcholine, when it's used in the peripheral nervous system, it is going to be used to stimulate. Remember, right, neurotransmitters can be either inhibitory or excitatory, and acetylcholine is, uh, can be both. All right? But in the peripheral nervous system, it's excitatory. It's going to stimulate skeletal muscle to contract. All right? In the central nervous system, it's also going to help to increase arousal. What is arousal? That's how aware you are. Are you sleepy, drowsy? Then you're not very aroused, all right? 
So acetylcholine is when we take two uh, substrates called acetate and choline, and we uh, stick them together to form acetylcholine. And so we store acetylcholine in those synaptic vesicles that are floating around in the synaptic map. So a story as old as time, the action potential will trigger its release into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine will diffuse across the synaptic cleft. It'll bind on to the postsynaptic receptor. And then it'll initiate whatever type of effect that's going to occur. Now, we never talked about what happens afterwards, right? So we just had our party. We released our neurotransmitter into the cleft. It's still just hanging out in the cleft and some of it's bound on to the receptors, okay? But now we got to clean everything up. Okay, because we want to have another party. We got to clean up the first party first. So we've got to clear the acetylcholine out of the cleft. Okay, how do we do that? Well, guess what? We're going to bring in acetylcholine esterase. ACHAs is a shortened version of it. Okay, acetylcholine esterase is this enzyme that's going to come into the synaptic cleft and it's going to break down acetylcholine back into its substrates of acetate and choline. And it breaks it down. And then what will happen is the presynaptic neuron is going to take up those substrates, recycle them, and make acetylcholine, and then stick it back into the synaptic vesicles, and then release it again when the next action potential comes down. Okay, so we're going to see here when we talk about cleaning up our party, there's a couple different ways that we can do it. The first way I just talked about. Here's our enzyme, all right, that sits there in the cleft, and we, we break down the neurotransmitter, and then we uh, put it back into the presynaptic neuron. That's one way that we can remove the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft, because, you know, if that neurotransmitter stays in the synaptic cleft, and especially if we're dealing with acetylcholine and its skeletal muscle, you'll keep contracting that skeletal muscle, all right? And we'll talk about there's ways to stop that from happening, okay? One of the ways to stop the contraction is to get rid of the neurotransmitter. All right, so we have an enzyme to do that. We also have on our presynaptic neuron, that's the neuron that releases our neurotransmitter, we have these specialized proteins that are just gonna kind of hoover up or vacuum up any of that neurotransmitter. We don't even have to break down the neurotransmitter. We don't have to degrade it down into its substrates. Instead, we're just gonna take the vacuum, we're cleaning up the party, so get the vacuum cleaner out and hoover up all of that acetylcholine back into the presynaptic uh, neuron there, right? And then some of that neurotransmitter will just leave the cleft. You ever wonder, I don't think I have a picture here. <laughs> I'm gonna go back ways. Check it out. How come, right, you can see that the neurotransmitter goes across the cleft here, but guess what? Some of that neurotransmitter goes out here. Some of it goes over here, okay? It'll just go away. Well, don't worry, we got glial cells over here. They'll take care of it. They'll absorb it. They'll, they'll pick up that neurotransmitter. Okay. So some of that neurotransmitter just kind of wanders off. All right. Some will get broken down by the enzyme, the acetylcholine esterase. And then some will just get hoovered up by the presynaptic neuron there. All right. So this brings me into this next topic of the drugs, because we have drugs that are going to influence how we remove the neurotransmitter. And so the first one here is called an SSRI, also known as a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Folks that are depressed, they've found or have anxiety, but folks that are depressed will see that they have lower serotonin levels. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter. And so what will happen is, right, we're going to do something to prevent serotonin from leaving the synaptic cleft we're going to inhibit the reuptake, the hoovering up of that serotonin. So what will happen is, all right, the presynaptic neuron releases its neurotransmitter of serotonin into the synaptic cleft. And because you've taken this drug, it prevents the presynaptic neuron from hoovering up that serotonin. And so it stays in the cleft. And it'll stay, it'll keep binding onto those chemically gated channels. And it will exert its effects and help to treat depression. All right, we've got another classification of drug, the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, all right, the galantamine 
hydrobromide. This drug is great with Alzheimer's. I shouldn't say great, right? It's better than nothing, okay? But it prevents acetylcholine from being broken down. So it can stay in the cleft longer. So it can exert its effects. So it can help with, where are you? Central nervous system, increased arousal. So you're more alert. So this picture here is showing us some of the effects here. Zoom in. Okay, here comes our axe potential. You know the story by now, our neurotransmitter gets released into the synaptic cleft. There's acetylcholine. Here you can see the molecular formula. Actually, that's the structural formula too. Okay, so acetylcholine here is going to then diffuse across the plasma membrane. Now you're seeing how it affects, right, either directly or indirectly. Right? If it directly affects, we're going to see how it triggers the opening of our gates, and then our um, sodium can then diffuse down its concentration gradient and cause an EPSP. We'll see this in what we call nicotinic receptors. Right? So nicotinic receptors, and we found these receptors because they have a huge, uh, um, what's the word I want to use, um, affinity for nicotine. I mean, it loves, you have certain receptors in your body, and I can't remember the name, I can see the symbol here for the opioids, and they're not opioid receptors, it's another name, but you have these receptors in your body, that's why opioids are so addicting, because it, it's almost like a match made in heaven between the opioid drug and these receptors, and how, how they uh, affect these receptors, but we'll see that with acetylcholine and its direct effects, it stimulates the opening of the channel, and then directly allows sodium to diffuse across, All right? The other type is the indirect. This is the, where I was telling you about that G protein and that secondary messenger. So what will happen is it'll stimulate the receptor here to trigger the activation because this protein just hangs out. It's attached onto this receptor here. And when it's inactivated, it just hangs there, just waiting to get activated. So this is that butler scenario. So the butler, all right, is taking, here's our butler, all right, and here's our neurotransmitter, and it's saying, hey, I got a message for you. All right, no problem. It activates the butler, and then the butler wanders off. It becomes a secondary messenger, and then it goes and, and triggers some sort, again, you'll learn this in 211, it'll trigger a series of reactions inside the cell to do whatever it needs to do, make proteins, uh, make a hormone, whatever, okay? So in this situation, our indirect messenger right, can cause either an EPSP or an IPSP. Now, the muscarinic receptor is an indirect receptor, okay? So there's certain drugs that can block these types of uh, uh, receptors. Atropine, for one, is a great one. All right, so what we're seeing here, okay, uh, when we're talking about acetylcholine, one of the ways that we can prevent it from being released from the synaptic knob is through Botox, botulinum toxin, that causes flaccid paralysis. And how does it do that? All right? It's actually gonna prevent the release all right, of the acetylcholine. So it never makes it into the plasma member, uh, into the synaptic cleft. It'll never affect the skeletal muscle. That's why it takes the wrinkles away because the skeletal muscles are paralyzed flaccidly. So they relax, okay? That's what gives you wrinkles is when those muscles are contracted. All right, here you can see how we remove all right, our neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine gets broken down into choline and acetate through acetylcholine esterase. Okay? Some nerve gases like mustard gas and certain insecticides all right, will actually go ahead and block this um, uh, enzyme. And so if we're not able to clear acetylcholine, from the synaptic cleft, you'll have muscle spasms. In some cases, it can cause, uh, depending on which type of nerve gas is administered, you can get such bad muscle spasms that they'll contract so much, it'll start to break your bones. Crazy. All right, the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is neuromodulation. Okay, so what's a neuromodulator? All right, it's a chemical that is gonna regulate or alter responses of local neurons. Okay, so we have two types of neuromodulators. Well, we have ones that cause facilitation 
and others that call it inhibition. Inhibition is pretty much easy to, to remember. You're inhibiting something from occurring. When you're facilitating something, you're going to try, like for facilitating talks, you're gonna encourage something. So when we talk about facilitation, all right, the modulation that occurs is going to increase or cause a greater response in our postsynaptic neuron. So an example of that is if we increase the amount of neurotransmitter, what's that gonna do? If we increase the amount of neurotransmitter in the cleft, that's going to increase the number of postsynaptic receptors. And we saw how we can affect that with graded potentials. If we're opening up more gates, we're gonna get more ions to diffuse in. We can change that membrane potential more. So that's gonna be facilitation, All right? Inhibition, we're going to try to create a weaker response. How do we do it? We decrease the amount of neurotransmitter that's going to occur, that's going to be present in the cleft, right? Or we can decrease the number of those postsynaptic neurons there. Nitric oxide in the and endocannabinoids, right? Nitric oxide, you may have heard about this because one, it's a, it's a gas, which is wonderful because it has a short, very short half-life. But what it does is in the peripheral nervous system, it causes blood vessel dilation or vasodilation, which is wonderful for people that have circulatory issues. Folks also um, that have issues like with their heart, right? If they get heart pain, all right, uh, angina, okay, um, that is usually indicative of decreased blood flow to heart tissue. So if they take um, nitroglycerin, which has similar effects to the nitric oxide, it causes blood vessel dilation or vasodilation there. All right, endocannabinoids. This is if you've heard of marijuana, which I think everybody has. All right, these uh, molecules, all right, are going to affect, all right, the presynaptic neurotransmitter release. And so what will happen is that will make some folks more hungry, depending on which uh, um, uh, visceral nerves that we're uh, affecting. And it can also cause um, some issues with memory, some cloudiness or decrease in memory. So what is the term for the type of neuromodulation that results in a greater response from the postsynaptic neuron? That's gonna be facilitation. A lesser response is gonna be inhibition. All right, my friends, I didn't think I was gonna get through that. That's not bad. Um, 